With Mike Mayock and John Gruden at the helm of the Las Vegas Raiders, it seems like they're finally heading in the right direction. After a rocky 4-12 start in 2018, they added three more wins in 2019 to finish tied for second in the ultra-competitive AFC West. Well, yes, we can sit here and debate if Derek Carr is good enough to lead this franchise, and yes, we can also sit here and debate if the Raiders should have traded Cleo Mack in the first place. The one thing we absolutely cannot debate is how good some of their young players are starting to look. Josh Jacobs, in particular, is already developing into a dangerous weapon in this offense. What he does with the ball in his hands and how he consistently breaks tackles to create yards is really impressive. Outside of his skill set, which we'll focus on in this video, what really stood out to me is how well the Raiders paired that with Gruden's play calling. He's really formed a really versatile run game. It's a lot of fun to watch. Based on my film study, outside zone is one of the Raiders' best plays and it was Jacobs' most consistent run by far. He's great at stretching the defense horizontally before putting his foot in the ground to cut vertically up the field. I really like how far he presses the defensive line and linebackers outside before making his cut. He waits to the last possible moment and this helps his offensive line create angles for their blocks. It also makes it easier for Jacobs to break tackles as well. He usually does a good job of turning his legs and falling forward to gain extra yards on contact. Check out this run against the Chiefs back in week two. The Raiders were running outside zone to the right. Lining up in single back, Oakland was using nasty splits from the wide receivers on both sides of the formation. The goal with this alignment is to use the receivers like they'd use tight ends. It allows them to create angles and out leverage their defenders that are playing outside expecting them to run routes. This helps them create an advantage in the run game. Now typically, when you run outside zone to the weak side, the play call is actually called mid zone and not outside zone which has a different landmark. The key distinction here is that because the receivers are lining up so close to the formation, they can actually run either. The benefit of running outside zone in this situation is that you can fully stretch the linebackers, whereas mid zone tends to hit inside the offensive tackle based on how the linebackers flow to attack the play. Let's see what happens here. After the snap, the defensive end established outside leverage. Jacobs reads the leverage of this defender, moves on to the second read, which is the defensive tackle inside of him, and then he makes his decision. Jacobs correctly decides to sprint through the B gap between the right guard and the right tackle. He presses outside and then cuts vertically once he gets to the second level. He then avoids the backside linebacker who is cut blocked and burns the safety to pick up 51 yards on the play. I love the way he runs on this play. Being a good outside zone runner is all about patience, structure, and discipline, and Jacobs has it all. He can also break tackles and create chunk plays as well. Out of the 45 running backs with more than 100 rush attempts, Jacobs was ranked 12th in breakaway percentage, which are runs of 15 yards or greater. Jacobs is clearly more than scheme. He creates a lot on his own, and as a rookie, he's already near the upper tier in terms of that ability. He's already a really good running back overall. Speaking of scheme, I tracked his 243 rushing attempts by hand to figure how Jacobs performed in this offense. I went play by play, and based on the orange bars, you can see what Jacobs created in addition to what his offensive line blocked for in blue. Based on my tracking, Jacobs is excellent two specific play calls, outside zone and power. Gruden calls those plays first and third most frequently in this offense. What really excites me about this scheme is the variety of play calling that I saw. How Gruden sets up those base level plays is really cool to see. He doesn't run them in one particular method. For example, even though outside zone and inside zone made up over 70% of Jacobs runs as a rookie, Gruden actually calls outside zone 11 different ways. For inside zone, Gruden made even more adjustments. He calls that play a whopping 16 different times. You rarely see this level of variety in terms of play calling. Gruden loves mixing in jet sweeps and orbit motions with the wide receivers. He likes using different pin pull blocking schemes. I also saw a variety of handoffs with bearing footwork from the quarterback. And I saw two back and one back runs where Gruden used a fullback as either the lead blocker or as a kickout blocker in this offense. It was a lot of fun to track as I went through all of his plays. It made anticipating play calls extremely difficult, even after analyzing every single one of his runs. Check out this two back outside zone run in week 11 against the Bengals. The pre-snap motion is something I want you to focus on for this one. Before Derek Carr motions Darren Waller from the right side of the formation to the left, the Bengals have six defensive players to the right while they have five in the box. The Raiders then send Waller in motion. Watch closely how the Bengals' defensive line and linebackers shifted to their left to account for the tight end. Now after the motion, there are only five defenders on the right with only four in the box. While this may seem simple, one fewer blocker on the right means one fewer defender to cover the associated gap, the most important difference is where the box players align. The Raiders have now created a leverage advantage based on this simple motion. Look closely at the defensive line to the right of the center. The defender in the A-gap moves from the two-eye technique on the inside shoulder of the right guard to a one technique lining up on the outside shoulder of the center. Meanwhile, the defender that was in the C-gap as a five-tech defender on the outside shoulder of the right tackle moved to the B-gap as a four-eye tech defender on his inside shoulder. This fundamental shift is extremely important to point out. With the running play now drawn on your screen, you can see how each blocker to the right has an advantage. 
They can now reach block their defenders more easily, and this is how they create the running lane. All Jacobs has to do is take the toss, sprint to the edge to stretch the defense, and this allows his blockers to create their angles. Jacobs can then cut into daylight, picking up yards on this play. This is a big run, all due to that initial motion and Jacobs' finish. Gruden did this routinely with his tight ends, using motions and shifts to create matchups for his line. He does this to create leverage advantages, and as you can see, it clearly works. According to my tracking, 47% of Jacobs' runs featured some sort of motion. Most of that involved a tight end, but other times the Raiders use a wide receiver or running back before the snap to help disguise the run. What I found from this data was really interesting. On Jacobs' runs that featured a pre-snap motion, he gained an additional half of a yard more per carry on those runs. Now, if you look at plays where the offense used motions behind the line of scrimmage, like jet sweeps and orbit motions with the wide receivers, or sift blocks from the tight ends, the same was true for these plays as well. Jacobs created over two more yards per carry on those runs than he did without that motion. Needless to say, this scheme is extremely diversified. You then pair that with a running back of Jacobs' talents, and it makes it a lot more difficult to stop. The question you might be asking is why doesn't this offense run motions before the snap and during the snap on every single play? It seems like that's the obvious solution to this problem. The reason why they don't do that is very simple. As an offensive coordinator, you have to pair the backfield action to the passing game as well. Both parts have to work hand in hand. If you always have a wide receiver running an orbit motion behind the running back, he's taken completely out of the pass play unless he's used as a check down. Most offenses don't want to sacrifice a slot receiver when you can have him run a full route tree. Remember, the key point in football is that everything's a balance. You have to make sure you're using all your pieces correctly in order to ensure your scheme stays unpredictable and multifaceted. That's why they can't do this on every snap. Now, throughout this video, the one thing you may have noticed about Jacobs is how good he's at breaking tackles. This is one of his best traits, and he's near the top in the entire NFL in this ability. I showed this graph in my last breakdown in Nick Chubb, and this ability is also what separates Jacobs as well. Even on fewer overall touches than some of the best running backs in the league, Jacobs created the same or even more broken tackles. He's unbelievable in this category. This ability is the main reason why he creates so many yards independent of what his offensive line blocks for. Now, in that same video on Nick Chubb, I also showed the following graphic. This is the NFL's breakdown of their best running backs based on rush yards over expectation. As you can see, Jacobs in his rookie season is already among the top three in this metric. You have Derrick Henry and Nick Chubb at first and second respectively. You then have Jacobs in third, and you also have Christian McCaffrey in fourth place based on their analysis. In my last video, I went through the reasons why I think there are flaws in this metric. However, it all comes down to the same point. Jacobs in my metric and Jacobs in the NFL's own next-gen stats is already a top-tier running back in his rookie season. There's no reason to think that'll stop next year based on everything we've seen so far in this video. Before we move on and talk about how Jacobs is used in the passing game, I wanted to bring up the one negative I saw from going through his film. Jacobs has a habit of jumping too hard on plays and he'll miss gaps which will slow down his momentum. He made some awesome cuts using the same Madden-esque juke, but sometimes it didn't put him in the right position to attack the line of scrimmage. On zone runs, he'll sometimes outrun his blocking scheme due to poor pacing. This will put him into precarious positions. Now, this didn't happen all the time, but it did happen enough for me to point it out in this breakdown. It happens probably twice a game where I simply want Jacobs to bury forward and take the dirty play. He'll just try too hard to make something happen when I don't think there's anything there. Again, this isn't a huge problem, but I did notice it as I went through his film. A moment ago, I mentioned the passing game, and this is the final thing I want to talk about in this breakdown. As a rookie, Jacobs was primarily used as a checkdown or as a screen receiver in this offense. He uses the same level of looseness to create yards after the catch that he does on his runs. By all reports, it seems that Gruden wants to get him more involved in the passing game. I see an uptick in his overall usage and targets during his second season based on that fact. The question you might be asking is how? How will or how should Gruden do this for his offense? After looking around the league at some of the best pass catching running backs, I think it comes down to two areas. The first is on design passing plays where Jacobs is the primary target. He so far as a rookie hasn't been given this sort of treatment. I think that'll start to happen next year. For an example of a play that Oakland could use next season, we can look at how the Panthers use Christian McCaffrey in their offense. Some coaches call this play the Zampezi concept. This play features a drag receiver with a Texas or angle route out of the backfield from the running back. What happens is that the corner route by the tight end and the drag by the outside receiver both pull the zone coverage backwards. This creates a gap underneath for the running back. I can see Jacobs running the same exact concept next season. It's a part of the same quick passing game that Gruden already uses and will instantly get him the ball in space. This will allow him to do what he does best. The other way I'd recommend the Raiders getting Jacobs the ball in the passing game is on choice routes. This is a very popular concept in West Coast systems, just like the one Gruden runs. 
It features a slot receiver or a running back making a decision or a choice based on the leverage of his defender. Depending on which way the defender leans and positions himself after the snap, Jacobs can theoretically win in either direction. This is a very dangerous concept underneath, but it does require a running back to have good fork and body control to fully execute. He also has to have a good understanding of defensive leverage as well. Based on everything that I've seen from Jacobs, I think he has the ability to run this concept next season. Regardless of how Gruden actually ends up using Jacobs in the passing game, the future is clearly bright for this young star. I see him becoming one of the top running backs in all of football in a very short time. His ability to create yards in addition to what his offensive line blocks for is what separates him as a player. As we've already talked about, he is so good at dropping his hips and jumping from gap to gap. He knows how to perfectly stretch zone runs outside in order to create angles for his offensive line. While yes, Jacobs doesn't have elite speed, this simply isn't necessary for him to be great. He more than makes up for that by breaking tackles and by always fighting for extra yards. Overall, Jacobs is a really good running back. In this scheme, he's more than equipped to be a dangerous weapon for the Raiders. Well, that's all I have for you in this one. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Also, if you support me on my Patreon, my fantasy football rankings are now available in the link below. My last few videos broke down who I like, who I don't like, and my overall strategy on who I think you should take in your fantasy drafts. If you want the Excel versions of all those files, all it takes is just a $1 donation, and I'll gladly update those rankings all summer long. Until next time, you could follow me on Twitter at Samuel R. Gold.